morning. Man, that was an awesome song. That was the first time I've ever sang that song, and that was, a, that was an awesome song. We'll have to see if that one's in our book. Try to learn that one. Um, thank you, Brother Charles, for the, for the prayer this morning, for myself and my family. Um, it really is a blessing to be able to have this opportunity. I need to say thank you to the church here for the opportunity to preach and to, to do this thing. I'm not a preacher by trade. Um, but in Vermont, uh, there were some opportunities that came up, and I had made a decision that when there was an opportunity, I, I wasn't going to say no. And it's been really great for me to have this opportunity because I learn the most whenever I study to prepare for a lesson, and hopefully you get something out of it as well. Um, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I preached a lesson that was titled, Boast Only in Christ. Um, and the idea being that contrast with boasting and works. And the idea there is, was summarized by, we are saved by grace through faith. That was the crux of the matter. And it, it was summarized by Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as the result of works, so that no one could boast. And we spent almost all of our time in Romans chapter uh, chapters 1 through 3. We're going to be in Romans again today. So if you want to turn over to the book of Romans, we're going to be spend most of our time in chapter 6. This is going to follow up on that, on that last lesson. Um, a good portion of our lesson last time was in Romans chapter 3. Another summary for what we talked about, Romans chapter 3 verse 28 says, For we maintain that a man is justified, how? It says they're justified by faith apart from works of the law. And I, I can't believe I, you know, looking back on it, it's like I spent 40 minutes talking about that. And it's so simple. You're saved by grace through faith, not of works so that no one can boast. It's a simple message, but it's one we need to remind ourselves of continually that we not be puffed up. Now, a natural question follows from that. And when you read through Romans, what I love about the book of Romans is that Paul, as he's making points throughout the book of Romans, He's in your head, and he knows what thoughts are coming in your head. He knows after he makes some point, and he's obviously writing these things down through the inspiration of the Spirit, but it's like he knows as he's telling you these things, he's like, the next question they're going to pop into your head is this, and he goes ahead and asks it. You don't even have to ask it. Like, we're not there in person to say, Paul, but what about this? He goes ahead, and he asks that question because it's a natural question that comes up. He does this all throughout the book of Romans. We were in Romans chapter 3 last time. Just skim through uh, Romans chapter 3. Look at how many questions he asks here. Chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage has the Jew? A natural question that follows after he's just demonstrated that the Jew is justly condemned just like the Gentile is because they're imperfect. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. If some did not believe, did their un unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? What about verse 5? What shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not righteous, is he? What about verse 8? Why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and some claim that we say, let's do evil that good may come. So he's making all these claims, and the na these natural questions come up, and he goes ahead and asks it for you and I, the reader, and then he addresses it. He leaves nothing unaddressed. So following this conclusion that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, the humanistic way of the mind is to, is to go like this. So you're saying I can sin? So I can do whatever I want? Is that what you're saying? And so Paul is going to take that thought and spend chapter 6, chapter 7 to say, no, that's not what I'm saying. Don't get that twisted, right? I'm not saying that you're saved by works. You can't earn your way to salvation. But that doesn't also mean you can just glorify the fleshly lusts in your body, because elsewhere we know it says glorify God in your body. So that's a tough balance, and Paul's not going to leave that stone unturned. He's going to go ahead and address that right here. He asks four questions in chapter 6 and chapter 7. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. It says, what shall we say? Should we continue in sin so that grace would abound? Some people might ask that question. What about verse 15? What then? Should we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Flip over to chapter 7, verse 7. 
what should we say? Is the law sin? He'll ask that question. And then finally, Romans chapter 7, verse 13, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? So these natural questions are going to come up as he's making his points. We're going to spend all of our time looking at just the first two questions. Effectively this morning, we're going to do Romans chapter 6. My dad used to preach this sermon, and he would do it backwards. He would start at the end with, where it says the wages of sin is death, but eternal life is through Jesus, and he would work his way back to baptism. I'm just going to go forward in time. Okay, so here's a quick summary. We're going to look at those two questions that Paul asked. Um, should we sin so that grace would abound, and should we sin because we're under grace and not law? Um, <clears throat> and let me just give you the, the quick and short of it right up front. The le- Paul's going to give some answers to those questions, and here's the, an- here's the lesson from those answers. Um, you have died to sin. When you committed your life to Christ, you killed that way of life. Should be our mindset. And the second thing is, who do you serve? Is, is what he's going to basically talk about. Who are you a servant of? Do you serve sin in the flesh, or do you serve God? That's the question you need to, to even ask the question then clearly becomes absurd to ask, can I sin? Well, who do you serve? Are you a servant of God or are you a servant of sin? So that's the quick and short of the lesson this morning. All right, so let's jump right into it. We're going to start with the first question, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What should we say? Should we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Now, to understand where this question comes from, we need to back up just a little bit. Uh, We did Romans 1 through 3 last time. Romans chapter 4, Paul Paul demonstrates that the faith that saves was evidenced in Abraham, right? The the promise was through Abraham prior to the law coming. It was guaranteed because it was through faith. And he talks about this in Galatians as well. And then in chapter 5, he does this contrast or comparison and contrast between Adam, through whom sin entered the world, and Christ, okay? And so that comparison between Adam and Christ is what is going to motivate chapter 6, verse 1, that question. So let's back up and let's read Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 20. Here's what it says. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness, to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, to say that when the law comes in, transgression increased, that's just saying that the purpose of the law was to make evident what sin was, was to say explicitly sin is X, Y, and Z. Romans chapter 7, verse 13, if you flip over there, makes this pretty clear. At the very end, it says, sin in order that it might be shown to be sin, that was what the law did, by effecting my death through that which is good, so that, here's the, here's the key point, through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful, right? So the point is, do you know it's wrong to steal? Of course you do. Do you know it's wrong to kill somebody? Of course you do. Do you need the law to tell you that? No. Instinctively, we understand that. There's some sort of universal moral code out there. But the law came and it made sin utterly sinful. It made it explicitly bad because it was written down. That's what it's saying in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. So it says then, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So here's the thing to consider. If you've got some person, you know, all sin is sin which would separate us from God. doesn't matter how much, right? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. But you take a person who has lived, say, 70 years without God, no commitment to Christ, pursuing and indulging in the passions of the flesh, and someone who committed their life to Christ when they were 20 and lived some life. You might, you might have this idea come into your head that, you know, is there enough grace for God to cover the man who commits himself or woman who commits himself to Christ at 70 years old? Is the grace of God that big? The answer is yes, it is. But what about, it's just as big for the person uh, who committed their life when, they're, when they were 20, Right? But it seems in our heads, in our humanistic ways of weighing things, that there's more grace for the person who committed their life at 70. I'm just giving an example here, right? Here's the point. How much grace does God provide for forgiving sins? Just enough, right? Enough. There is no 
there is no bad, not enough bad that a person can do that, that, that Christ's sacrifice is not good enough for them if they truly repent and commit themselves. So how much grace is there? It's sufficient, right? So the humanistic way of thinking then is, well, if I were to get more grace, I would need to sin more, perhaps, right? And so it's like, oh, great, right? Because Paul has j- just made this point, God's grace is sufficient. Right? Where sin increased, God's grace increased all the more. It's enough. But the humanistic way of taking things is, so for me to get more grace, I need to sin. Now, I tried to think about, like, what's a practical way that, you might, that people might come to this conclusion? Sometimes you see people talk about their former life in sin. Maybe they, they give their testimony and, they, and they, uh, they might speak to something to the effect of, you know, here's how bad I was but then God saved me, I committed myself to Christ. We should never brag about our former life in sin and talk about it as if to, I don't know, have people look up to it in some way. We should never speak about our testimony in that way. But sometimes it might come off that way, and someone might walk away with this conclusion. They, they might think, in order for me to say the same, I would need to indulge in the fleshly lust, indulge my fleshly appetites so that when I come to God, I could say, see how much grace I now have that I have come to God. That's the wrong mindset. Okay, so that's sort of the question that Paul's addressing. How much grace is there? Enough. Oh, so I should sin so that I can get more grace? Let's look at his answer, starting in verse 2. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, Paul's just made an assumption. There's an there's something we can walk away with, at least at this point. Apparently, these people had already died to sin, right? That is implied by Paul saying, you've died to sin. How should you still live in it, okay? Now, the question is this. When in chapters 1 through 5 did Paul ever talk about these people dying to sin? It's not there in chapters 1 through 5. What Paul had demonstrated prior to making this point is that salvation is by grace through faith. So the point where we're at right now is there's some connection between the faith that saves and dying to sin somehow. And we're going to see where that connection comes in a minute. Dead to sin, what Paul is saying, dying to sin, is somehow related to the faith that saves. So let's keep reading. Verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For we, if we have become united with him, with Jesus, in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Okay, so chapters 1 through 5 was salvation by grace through faith. And that apparently is coincident with the crucifixion of the old man, our death to sin, crucifying that way of life, and walking in in newness of life. And chapter 3 makes a connection for us. It says that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into that death. Here's the point. When we recognize their sin in our life, and when we understand who Jesus is, who he was, the life that he lived in coming to earth and making a sacrifice for our sins, and we repent and we come to him, that's faith working in us. The culmination of that faith is baptism. That's the culmination of that faith. And I'm trying to make this point because you will run across people who will make the claim that Baptism is a work. And since Paul has just demonstrated we're not saved by works, baptism is unnecessary. Clearly, in this instance, and everywhere that Paul talks about this, Paul puts baptism in the faith category. Right? There's this contrasting of things. Salvation by faith and salvation by works. Justification by grace through faith. Justify yourself by being perfect. And Paul is saying, baptism is not in the works category, it's in the faith category. The culmination of our faith is when we commit ourselves to Christ and we are buried with him in baptism. 
Now, when he says, I'm going to reread verses 6 and 7, it says, our old self was crucified with him. When? When was it crucified? It's, we're going to see it's something to do with their mind, with their faith. Faith is a heart matter. And when they were baptized, the, cru- uh, the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin. So the old self is crucified. The body of sin is done away with. Here's the idea. What was killed in the old man? Are you, you are alive today. When you were raised from the watery grave of baptism, you still had the same flesh, same atoms and all these things. What was killed was the old way of life. You killed a mindset that said, I'm going to indulge the flesh. You have these fleshly passions and you killed the mindset of I'm going to pursue it. You made a decision, which was I'm going to, I'm, I am resolved to no longer live that way. I'm going to serve God. You, ki- you see what I'm saying? You killed the old man, that old way of life. That what was, is what was crucified when we commit ourselves to Christ. It reflects a changed heart and thus our faith. They're one and the same. Faith is ultimately a heart matter. It makes it clear that the faith that saves, which Paul has just talked about in the first part of Romans, is associated with that resolution to put away that old life. You're reminded of the responders to Peter's sermon in Acts 2, right? Peter demonstrates to them who Christ was, and they realize, oh my goodness, we just killed the Son of God? And they add, it says they were pricked to the heart, and they asked Peter, what should we do? That demonstrates on the inside, things were working. On the inside, they were pricked to the heart, and they said, what should we do? And admitting, they were admitting, we messed up, right? The mindset starts with, I am aware of my sin, and I admit it. I confess my sin. And and Peter's response is, repent and be baptized. And the same, these people who he's speaking to had gone through that process. You have died to sin. Repentance is a key ingredient in that process. It reflects, what is repentance? Well, it's deciding not to do what you were doing and do something else. It reflects an attitude which is resolved now to resist the fleshly passions, to resist fleshly temptation. And it's more than that. It's also to now do something else, to pursue God and service to God, right? There's two things. And this is the title of the lesson is dead to sin, alive to God. Dead to sin is I'm not doing that anymore. Alive to God is I'm going to now live this way, right? Repentance is both things. So when we repent, this is me killing that old life. It's, it's, an, it's a critical ingredient in this process. So it's more than just resolving to resist fleshly temptation. It's a decision to every day pursue service to God. What does service to God looks like? Tons of, th- that's the fruit of the Spirit, right? We don't pursue that in order to earn our way to heaven. We pursue it because we wish to serve God. Because I killed that old way of life. And that's Paul's answer here. Should we sin so that I can have more grace? No, don't you get it? When you adopted that faith, that mindset, you killed that way of life. How can you still live in it? That's his answer in verse 2. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Right? If you, if you adopted that faith that saves, that's the mindset that you should have. And now we are alive to God. Now that latter thought, living to God now, he's going to continue in verse 8. So let's keep reading. If we have died with Christ, this is our scripture reading, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Now, Paul's introducing a concept that's going to continue through the rest of the chapter, master over him, your ruler, your king, who rules your life. It says death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. This reiterates the life after death to sin. You died to sin when we, re- when we repented and were baptized. We killed that old way of life. And now we are resolved to live differently. A resolution to resist and to pursue service to God. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but now alive. 
Not dead forever. You kill that way of life. Now you're alive for God through Jesus Christ. The mindset is, I am alive to serve God. Right? After this, we make a commitment for however long I live until my, body, my literal body is put in a, in a grave or cremated or whatever. Until that moment, my life now is for service to God. Right? And this idea, right? my body, I'm going to use my body for service to God, not to abuse it. I'm given this fleshly collection of atoms to walk and to breathe and talk and do these things. I'm going to use this now as an instrument for righteousness, to be resolved to do that. And similar thoughts for this idea are elsewhere. We're all familiar with them. Just flip over one to Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. That's our life now. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. When you serve the body and you serve sin, what fruit do you bear? Those things that lead to death. But now, verse 6, Romans 7, we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You see what he's saying there? We serve now in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. The oldness of the letter is to, is to seek justification just on the external actions, what I do. Right? But in the newness of the Spirit, you'll probably have a, it, some Bibles will capitalize that. I think the better translation is that it's lowercase. It's not Holy Spirit. It's, it's your spirit, your internal person, right? To serve in the newness of the Spirit. It's an internalization of those things. Jesus taught, it's not just about, you know, do not murder. Do not think evil on your brother, right? Don't just commit adultery. Don't even look lust after a woman, right? It's an inter. We serve now in the newness of the Spirit. It's a heart matter. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24. This speaks to this. Listen to these words. In reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self. Isn't this what we've been talking about? In reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceits, but now be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Same concepts that are being talked about here. Be resolved, when we kill that old man, we now resolve to seek for a pure heart. Not just serving externally, but in our inner person. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 speaks to this. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. There's two sides to this coin. There's death to sin, but living for God. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, but now I live. And the life that I now live in the flesh, what I do from now on, I live by faith in the Son of God. I noticed in the, um, for the communion this morning, there was a message on the screen uh, referring to a scripture. And I flipped over and read that scripture, and I thought, man, that is right on point with this point that I'm trying to make here. So I just want to read this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And then we'll move on. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that what? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we were healed. These concepts are everywhere. Right, The Bible never taught that we can just do whatever we want. But Paul makes it clear also uh, that we are saved by grace through faith, lest we adopt a mindset that we're you know, some, some people to be looked up to as if we're better than other people. It's neither of those cases. Okay. So now, that's the answer to the first question. He's going to elaborate on this point a little bit more, and then transition into the next question. So let's start reading in Romans chapter 6, verse 12. It says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. 
And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but instead present your, yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Now he introduced this idea of death being a master over someone in verse 9 talking about Jesus, and he continues this thought here. What does reign imply in verse 12? If sin reigns in your moral body. Well, um, you know, if something is, you know, kings reign, they rule, they govern, right? And those things are things that we obey. And hence, that's the language that's used in the second part of Romans 12. It says, if sin reigns in your body, that means you obey its lusts. If sin is your ruler, you pursue the lust of the flesh. So what does sin reigning in you or in me look like? It is to go after it, to pursue it, to make no precautions against it, to make no efforts to suppress our fleshly appetites, and to present our bodies as instruments for unrighteousness. It's like if there were a business, a corporation of sin, it's like our body is some piece of equipment in there, just doing things to serve sin. And we are called to the opposite of those things, to flee from sin and instead pursue righteousness. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee from your youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. We're told to guard against sin. This is the protection against sin, sin reigning over you. Sin is not our king. The flesh is not our king. Jesus is. We are told to guard against sin. Ephesians 6.11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We're told to resist fleshly temptation. James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And instead of presenting our bodies as instruments for unrighteousness, we're told to present them as instruments for righteousness. Uh, Paul's going to continue in just six chapters later in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and tell them to present your bodies a holy and living sacrifice. He'll give them help in what that looks like, right? Trans, be transformed. How? Renew your mind. Not just an internal thing. It's also external. It also has to do with what we do and how we treat people, and that's the rest of Romans chapter 12. But it's all of these things uh, together. To glorify God in your body is to use your body as an instrument for righteousness. Not to serve sin, but to serve God. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19, where he's talking about sexual immorality. Use your body to glorify God, not the flesh. To live to God after we've died to sin, after we've killed that old way of life, we now live to God is to devote our resources, our, our mental efforts, our mind, and our body, what we do and say, to devote those things to his service rather than serving the flesh. The idea of service here, who we serve, that foreshadows the answer to the next question that's coming up. He's going to talk about this. Who do you serve? And it's brought up by verse 14. Read verse 14 again. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. We're not under law. We are under grace. It's like, it's like I am not subject to the, jurisdic the jurisdiction of Australia. I'm not under the law of Australia. We live in the United States. We're under that law. Paul says you're not under law, but under grace. Now, what's the natural question that somebody says, right? So, you're saying I can sin? Right? That's where some human is going to take it that way. And Paul's like, all right, let me go ahead and ask that question. What should we say in verse 15? Should we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? So now he's going to address that one. Um, consider the following logic. If someone were to ask you this question, do Christians sin? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, is the relationship between a Christian and God, is that relationship such that God will forgive your sin? Yes, it is. Hmm. So the person says, so you're saying I can sin, right? That's where they want to take things. And, um, you know, why not sin because I can, apparently? That's not what the text is saying. The idea actually is to sincerely ask that question is to demonstrate an unfit heart. If you're really asking that question, 
it demonstrates you didn't that that is not the faith that saves. It's not you know faith is clearly associated with one committed to God, one that has killed that old way of life. Paul's already addressed that. So, so to even sincerely ask the question, Paul is sort of asking it hypothetically, right? In case somebody's mind goes that way. But if you're sincerely asking that question because you want to sin, that is you saying, I want to serve sin. And Paul's going to say, no, who you obey is who you serve. So let's look at his answer here in verse 16. Don't you know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, so he's saying, if you actually decided, I'm going to sin because I can, that is you saying, I will, that is you saying, I will present myself as a, as, um, a slave to, uh, to sin ultimately. When you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. If you ask the question, should I sin because I can? You are deciding within yourself to serve sin. That's not the faith that saves. If you obey the lusts of the flesh, then you are a servant of sin. And the result here in verse 16, it says, is death. The opposite is, if we obey God, then we are a servant of God. And this results in righteousness, it tells us. Continuing, verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, though in our former life we made no hesitation, we pursued sin. This fleshly body of mine would lead you in a particular way, and you went after it. We were formerly slaves of sin, but you became obedient from the heart to that former teaching to which you were committed, and you have been freed from sin. You became slaves now of righteousness. You're going to serve somebody. If you pursue sin, that's who you serve. If you obey the lust of the flesh, you're serving sin. But he says now, these people who he's speaking to have become slaves of righteousness. You serve God now. And uh, notice the mindset that's spoken about at the, in the latter part of 17. Let me read it again. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. He's talking about repentance. They committed themselves to be obedient to something that they taught, just like the people in Acts 2 on Pentecost. They heard this thing. Peter said, don't pursue this, pursue this. What do I do? Repent. When you commit yourself to that life, that's repentance. He continues in verse 19. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. I keep talking about our body like it's a piece of equipment, and I think about this, right? Like I've got my computer at work, and that's used for work things. I have my car that gets us to and from different places. We all have equipment and things that have a particular purpose. This body that we have for this short period of time can be used to serve, can be used in either of two businesses. It can be used and dedicated to the flesh itself because it has these fleshly appetites. And you can decide, I'm not going to suppress that. I'm not going to make any precautions against it. And that is to be in the business of sin. But instead, it says, present your members. What's it say? Present your members as slaves to righteousness. Work in this business. Work for God. Use this thing to serve God. And it's a mental exercise. It's more than just physical. It's a mental exercise to wake up every morning and decide those things. B because it's a challenge when we go out through our, right? I mean, sin is tempting. <laughs> if it weren't tempting, it wouldn't be called a temptation. It's tempting. And we're going to lose that battle if we don't prepare our mind every day. And that is a part of being in this business, right? Right? You, gird, you, 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 you prepare your mind to do the work that you do now if you're retired than when you did work or whatever. You prepare your mind to do these things. It's the same thing here. We are servants of God. We work in that business. Prepare your mind for that every single day. It's that mental exercise. That's the armor of God that's spoken of in Ephesians 6. To put that on every single morning and be ready. He continues, and we'll finish up here. 
through the rest of, of chapter 6, verse 20 through the end. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. Eternal death, by the way. Separation from God. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. And he finishes, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in answering these two questions, uh, Paul tells the people, when you committed your life to Christ and when you repented, you effectively killed that old self. You crucified the old man. And a part of that faith that saves is a resolution to now serve God, which was the theme of his answer to the second question. Who do you serve? If you obey the lust of the flesh, you're serving sin. You're devoting your body to the service of, of Satan, effectively. But we're called to live to God, to present our members as instruments in the business of God's work. So now we do understand that the Scripture elsewhere that instructs us in certain behaviors is not suggesting that we are saved by doing those things. We're not saved, we don't earn our way to heaven by seeking to love, by seeking to be kind and gentle and exercise self-control. We pursue those things not so that we can earn our way to heaven, not so that we can look down on anyone else, that's the wrong mindset, but we do that, why? Because it reflects the faithful heart that does say. It reflects our resolution to kill that old way of life. It reflects our resolution to serve God now. One that is resolved to flee from sin committed now to the service of God, and this will look very different from the world, right? It's like taking this, this body that we have to set it apart for God's work. That's what a holy item is one that has been set apart for service to God. And in this way, our bodies are sanctified. Our lives are sanctified because we dedicate them to Christ. That's the idea in Romans 12.1, right? Present your bodies a holy and acceptable sacrifice. And the rest of Romans 12 is practic what that looks like practically, being hospitable, being kind, and all these different things. So this morning, consider within yourself, what is your relationship with God? Have you repented? Have you killed that old man? Have you killed that old way of life? Who do you serve? What does your everyday life look like? You see these, you know, if... if High schoolers are interested in a job. They got all kinds of YouTube videos. A day in the life for a doctor. A day in the life for whatever. What's a day in the life of the Christian? What does your life look like every morning? What work are you in? Do you make a conscious decision every morning to serve God? Have you made that first step in committing yourself to God to repent and say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm resolved to make that effort. As de not saying we're going to be perfect. Because we're not. I'm not. But it's a conscious effort and a sincere effort to pursue those things on a daily basis. Paul says the culmination of that faith, of that faith is baptism. The, the, the water is here. To be baptized in the watery grave of baptism, buried with Him, and then when we're raised in the likeness of His resurrection, it's a new life committed now to God. If you have questions about this, talk to someone. Come and speak to me. If you need prayers this morning, come forward. Sit on the, on the front row here. Come speak to somebody. And if you need to be baptized, won't you do it now? If you've got questions, ask someone. All right, if you're subject to the invitation, let's stand and sing our song.